Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage The Vault Series. Today's clip comes from an interview we did with the Swampers down at Muscle Shoals Sound back in 2008. In this interview, we talked to Jimmy Johnson, Roger Hawkins, and David Hood about a subject a lot of people are not familiar about, which is that Leonard Skinner recorded their first sessions at Muscle Shoals Sound. Things didn't quite work out, but they came back together in the end. The album was released with two new singles added to it after the horrific plane crash happened. It's called Leonard Skinner First and Last. Hope you like it, and if you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Hope you enjoy it. The Swampers. <laughs> Leonard Skinner, my understanding is that, they, that you or y'all found them first, and then that album didn't come out until you couldn't get a deal with them or something, and then it came out after Al Cooper had done his thing with them. Alan Walden came to us from Macon, Georgia, and uh, he had, uh, of course, he and his brother Phil had worked with Otis Redding as a manager. And after Otis's death, they were looking for different ones, and they found the Allman Brothers, and then uh, Alan came up with Skinner. Well, Phil didn't want nothing to do with them. And so Alan took them himself and brought them up here and uh, uh, presented them to our new uh, published production company. And uh, Barry played the product for me, and I love the uh, two twinning guitars, and I love Ronnie's voice. And uh, and I told him I wanted to do them. And so we, uh, we started cutting them on weekends at our second studio, and uh, and two, when I could get them in here on weekends, we cut here, and uh, most of the time here, and uh, so we cut the first album here before Al Cooper or anybody, and uh, it took us two years to do it, and we had a total of 17 songs that we recorded, and uh, we when we started pitching it around, we pitched. Uh, I think the original thing we, uh, was full 16 or 17 cuts. Uh, all the labels couldn't handle the length. Three, three and a half minutes was the longest for a single they would tolerate. Well, what happened with the, uh, when you sent it initially to uh, where the tape was uh, turned around? Well, uh, did that come later? Uh, actually, uh, Well, it may have come first. Either uh, Alan or Phil, they heard it. They it, was, it was they, Alan. They Alan like had, uh, we put it on a seven inch reel. And it was, uh, at that time, I think it was two track, quarter inch. And uh, somehow Alan got the tape turned around, it was playing on the back it was side. twisted. So when he was carried in to play it to the A&R people, he was playing the back side of the tape. And you know, that sounds awful if it you've was, ever heard the, the back side of the down, tape. Room, room muffled, well, of course, they got turned down every time. They didn't he, like the sound. Every time he pulled the tape out, <laughs> nobody would touch it. And, uh, and if you can imagine, right? And then I think the few places that maybe before it turned around, they turned it down because the songs were too long. And, uh, and a couple of places had asked me to re if I, if they love Freebird. And they said, would I edit Freebird down to under three minutes? And I refused because it was a, like a, a nine minute song. And I said, there's no way. That would totally disrupt the, the whole thing of Leonard Skinner if you cut that song down. And you know, I, I just said no. And so everybody passed. But uh, most of the people heard the back side of the tape. And they were, they, it was because it sounded so terrible. Muffled. And nobody knew it until two years later, uh, I had gotten a call from Ronnie cussing me out because he heard it too. And he thought, of course, it was the worst sound he ever had, and he was right. And I didn't know what had happened. And so I told him, I said, if you don't like that mix, you don't like Leonard Skinner. And I slammed the phone, didn't talk to him for two years. And so we, we just had a real falling out. Emotional music is emotional. And then Ronnie calls me one night two years later, and they're in the studio working with Al Cooper. And uh, Al Cooper wanted to hear one of our cuts off of our albums. Well, they stuck the reel on. 
Rodney Mills is the engineer over in Atlanta, and he immediately recognized what was wrong. So he said, hold it. Pump, hit stop, flipped it over, hit play, and said the speakers almost came out of the wall. <laughs> and I mean, and Ronnie was completely destroyed that, you know, <laughs> that he, he wanted to kill Alan. <laughs> and uh, good thing he wasn't there. <laughs> and, he had uh, to eat his words a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and so he calls me right while they're in the control room. And, and, and Ronnie's crying and asked me to forgive him. And I said, man, done deal. I said, I, I, I do. I said, I'm sorry all this happened. But I said, I didn't know that it happened. He told me about flipping it. And so it just you know, made me and him both feel a lot better. <laughs> and so, and then later on, when they put out first and the last after the crash, uh, we, uh, we got back together again in the summer when they were off tour. And we were redoing parts on the, uh, which became the first 11 songs out of the first and last, which was their retrospect album, so to speak. And uh, and so, and then later on, around 1998, they put out a CD of uh, the whole Muscle Show 17 songs, and it's called Skinner's First, and that's done real well. What an unbelievable story! <laughs> I mean, can you I mean, imagine? Crazy. I mean, I, mean, I, mean. I, think, I think all our stories are unbelievable. <laughs> all of our stories, just like we planned it. <laughs>